All right, hello. We're a little early. We're about 10 minutes from the start of the webinar. I'm Perry Romanowski. Um, I'll be uh, taking you through this natural formulating web webinar. We'll get started in 10 minutes. But as we wait, um, why don't you let me know who we are, where you're from, and uh, I'll give you a shout out. I'm located in the uh, United States in Chicago. Um, and uh, my time is just up about noon. Uh, this is our monthly, mostly monthly webinar series where we cover topics re uh, relevant to people who are interested in formulating cosmetics. And today's topic is going to be on uh, formulating natural cosmetics. Um, so feel free to, if you uh, have questions, feel free to post them. Just look below this video. There's a spot where you can put your email address and a, and a question. I'll get to questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, but uh, before that, if you want to say, give me a shout out where, who you are, where you're from, that'd be great. Let's see if anybody uh, has uh, well, we've got a few people have already. So. All right. Uh, Gerard from Brazil. Hello. Um, we've got uh, Zara from Sweden. Welcome. We got people from all over the world. Robin from California. Hi, Robin. Um, we got uh, Mahat from Pakistan. Wow. See people from all over. We have uh, Juan from Bolivia. Uh, Bindu from India. Hello, everyone. Wow. This is this is great. We got Kathleen from Wisconsin. It's great to see you here. Thank you. Another one for Bulgaria. Uh, Valentina. Hello. New Jersey. Ah, oh, this is great. You guys are great. Uh, nice, nice and nice and active. So feel free to uh, post if you have a question uh, before we get started. Love to hear from you. Um, we got uh, Severine uh, from uh, Philly. Um, um, Crystal uh, says she's uh, she's stuck at work. Uh, yes, there's going to be a link sent after this, so you'll get to. Get to watch it at your leisure. Uh, we'll keep the webinar up probably about a week. Um, but yeah, we've got David from Sweden. Hello, David. Um, hello from Greece. Eliza from Greece. Yeah, uh, see, I see. I take my glasses off so there's no glare of the light, but then I can't read as well. So, so I, I might have to squint at the screen. All right, we're going to get started in just five minutes. I. Ah, I have my tea over there. Let me go get my spot of tea. I'm a tea drinker. Uh, not much for coffee, but I drink a lot of tea. Hot tea, too. It doesn't matter the weather. It's, it's always hot tea. Ah. All right. Uh, we've got uh, yeah, Greece, uh, Eliza. Yeah. If you, have, if you have questions right now, this is a good time to get them in. I will answer as many questions as I can after the webinar. We've got a, a pretty packed webinar, so I'm going to get started right on time. Ah, yeah. Incidentally, uh, if you're uh, into formulating natural cosmetics, here's one of the best books available on the subject, uh, Formulating Natural Cosmetics by uh, Anthony... Dweck. Um, this is published by Ali Red Books. Uh, I think you can still get copies of it. Uh, you have to contact them. Um, but one of the biggest tomes on the subject, and they go through a ton of natural ingredients. Very good. We cover a lot of this material in our uh, natural formulating course. Uh, but this, uh, you know, a book like this gets in much more detail. Uh, so, but, you know, uh, Reading books is a different way of learning than uh, doing webinars or uh, attending lectures or doing courses. So all kinds that uh, get you to learn are the, the kinds that you should try. A book is a great reference um, source. And I should get a deal with uh, all you read for <laughs> pushing their book. But um, it's, it's a good one. So we're going to get started in uh, just four minutes, four minutes. Um, but if you want to say uh, howdy, let me know where you're from. Let's see uh, uh, what we got here. Uh, Valora from Florida. Hello. Uh, California. Uh, Kunti. 
Hello, wow, we've got people from all over the world, all the way from uh, Brazil to Sweden, California. This is great you guys attended, I'm, and I'm glad. I, I hope this works out for a time. I, I experiment with different uh, times to do this, as we have people from all over the world, so I never know what works the best. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the sound is coming out all right. I have my microphone there. Looks like it's working okay. Um, yeah. Let's see, if you had a question, let's see, we had a, a question put in already. Um, see if there's some quick question I can answer. Here's a question about THC. Is there a special process needed to add a THC compound to a cream or lotion for topical use? And do you need FDA approval for such a product? Well, it depends on if you can get your source of THC uh, in, in a way that uh, gets around any kind of drug laws. Um, it, it, is a, it is still an illegal drug in the United States, uh, uh, technically, but there are states in the United States where it's not. But anyway, so putting it in a cream, it, you know, it depends on what claims you're making. If you're making anti-itching claims or any kind of drug claims, uh, then you, 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 well, you can't do that. It's not an approved drug. But if you put it in there and you just make cosmetic claims, um, that, that would be all right at the moment. So, no, you don't need, uh, but you, as far as FDA approval, no, you, you don't need FDA approval. Uh, but if you're making drug claims, uh, then it becomes a drug, and then you do need FDA uh, approval. You need to do specific testing and things, so. Uh, it's actually a hot topic. I think uh, in a future webinar or future something, uh, I should just cover cannabinoids and, uh, and, and formulating with them because it seems like such a hot topic right now. All right, we're going to get started in just one minute. Uh, got uh, Kelly from New York. How's it going, Kelly? Hey, we've got someone from Chicago right here in my fine city. It's a fine... Uh, Nearly wintry day, we had a uh, snowstorm over the weekend. We've got uh, Evan from, uh, or sorry, we've got Sven, a uh, uh, popular uh, uh, participant in our forum. He's from uh, South Africa. All right, uh, we're just about one minute away from the start. And We'll get started just soon. All right, I like to be on time. Uh, as far as finishing the, the webinar, will go about uh, an hour about. Um, I've got a lot of content, but uh, some of that will be content and some of that will be answering questions. All right, top of the hour, so let's get started. Hello, hello everybody. I am Perry Romanowski cosmetic chemist uh, and currently the president of the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. Uh, this is our semi-monthly webinar uh, in which we cover some topic of cosmetic formulating that's of interest to formulators around the world. Today's topic is going to be on natural formulating and this is the perspective of a cosmetic chemist, a formulator, a person who actually has to make products that get sold in stores or online these days. Um, it's, it's designed for le uh, all different kinds of levels, but uh, you'll see it, it's, it, we're not going to get too highly technical. We're just taking an overview of formulating natural products. All right, just uh, before we get started, I want you to take a look below the video box here. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to post those questions there. I'm going to answer questions um, at the end. And so I'll try to get to all your questions. If I don't get to your question, um, then I will, uh, if you include an email, I will email you a response. Uh, I try to respond to everybody's email, which uh, means after the webinar, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of time spent sending emails, but I'll get to what I can get to. Also, thank you to anybody who sent in a question early. Um, so let's get started. So I got to share the screen here. All right. And OK, 
Okay, here we go. There, there we go. Okay. So thanks so much for everyone for joining me on this webinar today. Uh, today's talk is going to be about a growing trend in the cosmetic industry and how it's going to impact formulators. Uh, I call this the Cosmetic Chemist Guide to Formulating Natural Cosmetics. The natural formulating trend has really caught on and this has really created uh, new challenges for science-minded cosmetic formulators. I'll cover many of the new challenges and we'll be uh, answering questions at the end. Uh, okay. A couple of things before we get started. Uh, we, uh, the first, I'm going to make sure you get the free bonuses for joining the webinar. So if you don't have it already, uh, I've got this handbook of practical formulating tips that you could find useful. It's a collection of articles that can help make you a better and more effective formulator. You can just download that right on the side. It's over 100 pages of pure content, uh, and it's yours free just for joining today. Uh, to, and uh, also, we have a special coupon code from Valdata Resource Manager Systems. Uh, this is a formulation manager that can help you keep your lab organized. So just click on the Valdata uh, Systems link and uh, use the coupon code PERRY1018 uh, to get 10% off of uh, any cloud subscription recipe manager for uh, one year. All right, we're going to cover a lot of information in this webinar, and I'll try to get everything in in about 45 minutes. And then I'll answer questions for 15 minutes or more, depending on how many there are. Topics we're going to cover include, um, sorry, just, just one moment here. These are our topics we're going to cover today, including uh, what are natural formulas, uh, how natural formulating is different than standard formulating, some natural formulation strategies, and then replacement natural ingredients. After this talk, uh, You'll have an idea of the different ways natural products are defined in the cosmetic marketplace. Uh, you'll see how leading cosmetic companies define natural uh, brands. You'll learn the four different strategies that you can follow to make natural cosmetics. And hopefully you'll get some ideas about natural ingredients that you can use to replace uh, standard ingredients. And we'll specifically talk uh, about, uh, mostly about preservatives and about colorants. Before we go on, just a little bit about me. Uh, um, I'm Perry Romanowski. I've been a formulator, educator, and speaker on the topic of cosmetic formulating for over 25 years now. Jeez. Uh, as I said, I'm currently the president of the Society of Cosmetic Chemists, and it's a great organization to be part of. You can go to seconline.org to learn more about that. Uh, but if you're international, we, there's also the, uh, the IFSCC. And so in your country, there is probably an SCC uh, for, for your country. So be sure to check that out. Um, I also had put together the Chemist Corner website back in 2008, I started that. And that's designed to be a resources for formulators. And you probably know about this since uh, you got, uh, this is probably how you found about this webinar. Uh, this forum that we have here is really useful. So if you have questions outside of this webinar or you have other kind of formulation challenges, feel free to go to the forum. Uh, we have we've have over 5,000 discussions there and uh, people are mostly nice. <laughs> some, sometimes we get some uh, uh, cantankerous uh, formulators who, uh, you know, they, they might be a little snippy with their answers, but not everyone's like that. And feel free, no matter what beginning level you are or what advanced level you are, go to the forum and, uh, and post your questions. Before I get started in the main portion, I just wanted to mention that you can get a much more detailed look at natural formulating in our course, our Practical Cosmetic Formulation Naturals Edition. Uh, the course is designed specifically for people who already have some formulating experience, but it's going to help guide you to making uh, natural cosmetic products uh, that you can actually sell on the market. You can get more information by going to the link that's uh, on this uh, uh, post right here. Uh, ideally, the link will show up uh, on the webinar video, but it doesn't always work. There's the link on how to get it. Um, at the end, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that and have a special offer for people on the webinar. All right, this is how I got started in the 
uh, natural formulating world. Uh, my first introduction was in the mid 1990s and I worked on a product called VO5 uh, and we had a product called VO5 Naturals. Now, essentially this product was just a knockoff of a popular brand at the time, uh, uh, Herbal Essences. Um, it was doing great on the market and our marketing people said, hey, let's do that with our shampoo and just make it natural. And all we did was we just took uh, change the color, change the fragrance, change the bottle a little bit. Although I don't know who thought that uh, aqua blue was natural, but <laughs> that's what they did. And we called it naturals is pretty much, this is sort of uh, what, what I call greenwashing. I'll talk about it later, but that strategy was what we did in the 1990s and it was effective. Soon it made up, you know, over 20% of our sales. We, uh, that led to the launch of another one called VO5 Herbals. As you can see, it sort of embraces the herbal, uh, the natural sense, even though there's nothing particularly natural about this except the story. Um, Tresemme, which was another brand that we had at the company. I worked on that one too. And we came out with our own Tresemme Naturals formula. Um, and actually this Tresemme Naturals is still around. And I think these VO5 products are too. Uh, but this is just proof that this type of formulating works and it it's still works then. It worked then it, and it still works to some extent now. Uh, but when I left the lab, I noticed uh, one of the most common requests on my website were questions about natural cosmetic products. And specifically, people wanted to know how to formulate their own chemical-free natural products. So that led to the development of the natural formulating co course. And I worked with All Your Red, and we did the Complete Cosmetic Chemist. Uh, but they got out of the... Uh, online teaching business a few years later. And so there were still hundreds of students in the course. And I thought I would just uh, start a new course. And, and so that's what I have. We'll talk about more details later. But all this is to say that right now, there really is a lot of interest in learning how to formulate natural cosmetic products. And this includes chemists who work for companies who want to make their own uh, products uh, more green. It includes entrepreneurs who want to start their own natural lines and even kitchen chemists who just want to make uh, products that they think is safer uh, at home. And in fact, um, over 1400 people uh, today have signed up for this webinar. So this, there's, a, there's a, a huge amount of people who have an interest in uh, natural formulating. Before I get into the details of how natural formula, uh, natural cosmetics are made, it makes sense to look at the natural cosmetic market. Uh, you can see the impact of green marketing by just walking down the beauty product aisle at your local drug stores or superstores. According to a Klein Group report, the natural cosmetic market reached about $30 billion globally in 2013. Uh, and a company called Future Mart, they just published a report recently projecting that the worldwide natural cosmetic market is going to be about $66 billion by 2020. So clearly, natural cosmetics represent a significant portion of the market, and it's not going away uh, anytime soon. Now, just to give you an idea of how does this compare to the overall market, the overall cosmetic market is about $450 billion globally. So this is, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the market. The natural personal care market, it's traditionally been a market that was the realm of small and local brands. Uh, lots of home crafters or brands sold at farmers markets would tout the naturalness of their products. And they frequently used uh, what I would call fear marketing to convince people that their products were somehow safer. Uh, but, you know, there is something compelling just about the, the term natural. And if you, uh, you have consumers who believe uh, that natural is better and safer, uh, then that's the kind of uh, marketing that uh, some places appeal to. But these are relatively small until uh, Burt's Bees kind of got big enough. Um, uh, two, two, two of the big brands, Burt's Bees and Toms of Naturals, they got bought out by some of the big guys. Uh, in 2006, Toms of Maine acquired, was acquired by Colgate, the toothpaste people, for $100 million. Um, a couple of years later, Burt's Bees was appealing enough to Clorox and they bought them in 2007 for nearly a billion dollars. Um, I don't know which company got the better deal, but right now, uh, Burt's Bees is the highest selling natural uh, product line that there is. Now, in order to uh, give you a cosmetic chemist perspective of natural formulating, it makes sense to first define what I mean by natural formulating. Um, 
Okay, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody was uh, getting this. <laughs> so you can see clear, you can hear clear, uh, and everything's working. You know, with this uh, technology, you never know when things are going to work or not work. But anyway, all right, so let's talk about uh, natural formulating and standard formulating. So before there was natural formulating, there was just formulating. We just, we just call it formulating. Now there is natural natural or organic or green formulating. So we have natural formulating and we have standard formulating. Now, some might imagine that the natural formulator is a friendly, laid back character, very much into plants and spiritualism and getting back to our roots and connecting with nature. And that the uh, standard formulator is this mad scientist character who is mixing up potions in the lab and making these synthetic uh, non-natural abominations. Uh, which are terrible for the planet. And of course, neither of these uh, characterizations are exactly true. The way that I look at standard formulating, for the most part, uh, the main driver for a standard formulator is product performance. It's all about performance. The product washes hair, the, it conditions, it uh, cures wrinkles. All It's all about performance. They don't they aren't terribly concerned with how you get there, but it's all about performance. You know, formulators want to use whatever ingredients they can to make the products that perform the best. They also have to balance the performance with the best formula aesthetics that they can uh, achieve. So, because even if a product is working, if a uh, if a consumer doesn't like the way it feels while it's working, they aren't going to purchase it as much. So they try to optimize the product aesthetics. And of course, depending on your company, um, formulators also have to work within these uh, reasonable cost constraints. When I was working on that VO5 Naturals line, uh, they said, you know, you can make uh, any any product you want, just it can't cost more than 10 cents uh, a bottle. So, so that, that really does limit what you can do. On the other hand, natural or green formulators are more focused on the ingredients that they use, right? They certainly want to make products that perform well, uh, but and and provide benefits to consumers. But this is not the primary driver. The ingredients and the source of these ingredients are really what's important to natural formulators. You know, formula performance, the aesthetics and the cost, these are kind of secondary considerations. The primary consideration is a focus on the ingredients. They limit themselves to ingredient choices that they see as natural. And, you know, some are more insistent on the naturalness of these ingredients than others. Uh, for example, some people um, will take something that's natural or it's natural inspired, you know, so that means it's from nature and then synthesized in the lab to make it nature identical. So there's all these different ways that people can uh, justify the use of what they consider natural. But it does lead to the most important thing that a natural formulator must do before getting into natural formulating at all. And it's defined exactly what does natural mean to you? And it turns out that this is not as easy as it might seem. Now, I should also mention that at this time, there's a ter new term, clean beauty, that you'll see around. Um, clean beauty is a marketing position that is it's slightly different than natural. The idea is that the formulators focus on product safety rather than just the origin of the ingredients. They avoid ingredients that they or their consumers consider toxins, uh, but it doesn't really matter where they come from, uh, whether it's nature or for the lab. The main consideration to the clean beauty set is that the, there's, the product is safe and also that it's ethically sourced. And for a cosmetic formulator, this might be an easier formulation route to follow than, say, a pure natural route. And as you're going to see, formulating truly natural products it can be pretty difficult. Now, to answer the question of what is natural, we have to look at the how the term is defined. And it turns out that there are many different perspectives on what the word natural means. Now, I just want to in inject a bit of reality here. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've been told or, or even what I say here, there really are pretty much no natural cosmetics. Um, there is no shampoo tree or lotion bush. You know, you can't plant a seed and then a few months later have a tube of lipstick come out. No matter what you do, cosmetics are just not like food. I mean, there is a banana plant, so you can get bananas are natural. There is no cosmetic lipstick plant, you know. So um, on some level, cosmetics are all processed. Truly natural cosmetics, you know, they pretty much don't exist. 
Now, there may be some ingredients in nature that have cosmetic benefits, and we're going to talk about some of those, but even these ingredients are going to have to be processed to be useful as cosmetics. And although there are no actually 100% natural cosmetics, there are some things that are more natural than others. Ingredients that are obtained from plants or chemically modified from plants or chemically identical to plant ingredients uh, are considered natural by, to, to some people. Now, deciding what is most important when it comes to natural uh, is what you have to do as the formulator. So it's up to you to figure out what does this natural thing mean? Um, now, although the definition of natural is up to you decide, you to decide, there are a number of factors that you have to consider when you're defining natural. And the factors that you have to consider are what do regulators think, what do consumers think, and what do retailers think. So let's start with uh, regulators. The term natural has no legal definition in the United States, in the EU, in Canada. There's, they really haven't defined natural uh, as far as cosmetics go. Now, there are, uh, there are some, are some other branches of the United States government who have a more specific idea of what is natural. But as far as the FDA goes, uh, the term natural has no definition. And in, and in fact, the FDA has said the FDA has not defined the term natural and has not established a regulatory definition for this term in cosmetic labeling. The FDA also does not have regulations for the term organic for cosmetics. The USDA, uh, US, United States Department of Agriculture, regulates the use of the term organic for agricultural products under the National Organic Program, the NOP. So if you're if your marketing is good enough, you're going to be able to find consumers who want the products, right? The brand that uses standard technologies can legally claim that they are natural, even if they're just doing that greenwashing. And I suppose that since there isn't any proof of something supernatural, you know, they have they might have a point. But, you know, things have changed a little bit recently due to the actions by the FTC. The FTC is the Federal Trade Commission, and they're responsible for policing the, the claims that people make about their products. And in 2016, they filed a suit against five different cosmetic companies for making misleading claims about their natural products. Um, they said that uh, the FTC said that they, they don't have a nat definition of natural, however, uh, if you're going to make a claim of 100% natural or all natural, then you can't have any synthetic chemicals in your products. Uh, they made it clear that uh, marketers who, use, who made these specific claims should not use synthetic chemicals. Um, of course, if this were read in a certain way, then pretty much no product would be able to be considered 100% natural because nearly all compounds used in cosmetics are, are chemically modified some way. The wording of the claims does matter a lot, and I would recommend you avoid claims like all natural or 100% natural, at least until the FTC clarifies what they mean by those terms. Now, just so you know, in the US, the you don't only risk government action, right? You also risk being sued by any con uh, consumer or lawyer who thinks that your natural products are not natural enough. The brand that I used to work for, the Tresemme, was sued recently for their natural product because uh, they, you know, the, the complainant said it contains synthetic chemicals, and indeed it did. Uh, they ended up settling the case for $3.2 million, and they've stopped actually selling uh, this specific line of natural products. Now, this is a real risk for brands trying to claim that they're natural, right? You really need a rationale for why your product is considered natural. And you have to be able to defend that in court. You may have to be able to defend that in court. So uh, even if you have an idea of what's natural, uh, be prepared to defend that. And if you wanna use the term organic, this is a bit more scary uh, because lawyers in California have found out that they can make money by going after companies that use the term organic, but they don't have uh, the USDA certification for organic. So brands like Baby Organics, Jason, Avalon Organics, or, or Organics, they've all had lawsuits brought against them. You know, some of these have settled and others have went on to change their marketing. And so it's my recommendation that unless you're gonna get certified, don't use the term organic in your marketing. Now, while, so that's the regulators and the, the legal system. And while the, 
those are important. Uh, it's also important to understand what the consumers think the term natural means. There has been a rise in the, uh, in the, in the world, really, of natural consumers who are looking for products that truly embrace the idea of naturalness. And maybe you're one of those uh, types of formulators or types of consumers. Um, and uh, these are called, in, in the business, they're called LOHAS consumers, they, they, consumers who have a lifestyle of health and sustainability. Uh, and big companies like to market products to these consumers because they tend to have a lot more money and are better educated and they spend more money. Uh, a report by World, the World Watch Institute suggests that the LOHAS consumer makes up about 30% of the U.S. consumer base. So it's a huge market. Uh, these are the people who shop at Whole Foods or they buy products that they believe are more natural and healthy for them. So here are just a few things that nat natural consumers generally believe. They think that natural products are safer, that they work better, that chemical free uh, their chemicals are bad and they kind of buy into free from claims. Uh, these consumers also try to avoid fragrances and preservatives. Uh, they, they see recycling and sustainability as really important. Uh, and they, they do tend to believe what the media and other fear mongering groups will say about products. And so they're a little skittish about products. And so when you're formulating, this is a thing you have to consider. Now, as far as scientific evidence goes, you know, um, natural is not necessarily safer. It does not necessarily work better. In fact, sometimes it, it doesn't work nearly as well. Um, avoiding preservatives is not a, really a safe practice. Um, avoiding fragrances, you know, th that's probably a good practice for some people, but if you like products that smell good, uh, that becomes harder to do. And of course, sustainability is really important, but what you really need to realize is that you're, you know, you're often making products for consumers who have been misinformed and they misunderstand some science. And as the product creator, you know, you're gonna to have to adjust your formulating strategies uh, accordingly. So maybe there's an ingredient that works great and you wanna use it, but if your consumers don't want you to use it, you know, you just can't use it. Now, after government and consumers, the next most important factors to consider are, uh, are what retailers have to say. Companies like Whole Foods, Walmart, Target, and in the UK, Boots, uh, they have come out with their own definitions of what they think qualifies as a natural brand. And so if you're going to sell into these companies, you better think about what they uh, consider natural. And just to give you an example, in the United States, Whole Foods has their own standard. They call the premium body care standards. And this is a list of ingredients that are not allowed to be used in any formula that wants to be considered for their premium skincare aisle. And this list of prohibitive ingredients, uh, you know, was made to take into account positive results of the ingredient, the, the source, the environmental impact, and even the safety of the ingredient. You know, unfortunately, the list doesn't exactly make sense. Uh, there are some things for, as from a scientist standpoint, it, it doesn't make sense. But, uh, you know, as a formulator, you just gotta shrug your head and uh, shrug your shoulders and say, hey, this is what I've got to formulate for if I want to get into Whole Foods. So you can see that whole list uh, with the link that I shared there. Now, whatever you're formulating, it makes sense to, to see what the competition is doing. And this is going to help you, you know, copy the good things and to avoid the bad things. In the natural cosmetic market, companies are taking different approaches to define natural. For the biggest brands, companies are coming up with their own definitions for natural rather than relying on uh, retailers uh, or consumers or even the natural standards group. As long as they can get their consumers to believe that their approach is natural, then it's natural. You'll see a lot in these natural brands is that they tell stories about how their brand was created, uh, and their philosophy on choosing ingredients. Uh, and the philosophy isn't always to pick, you know, an ingredient that uh, can be scientifically proven to be the best. Often it's to pick an ingredient that they're familiar with or that they have, a, it has a good backstory uh, or they has a great origin story. And uh, that's why people use ingredients. So you, you've got to, uh, you've got to find out what your consumer cares about. Now, here is a list of uh, some of the top natural brands in the cosmetic space uh, in the United States. Uh, you see that many of them are owned by big companies, right? We've got Burt's Bees owns Clorox, uh, Veda is owned by Estee Lauder, Aveeno owned by Johnson & Johnson, uh, L'Oreal 
well, they used to own the body shop. Uh, I think they just recently sold that off. Uh, but the point is here, just because something is a natural brand doesn't mean it's produced by a small company anymore. Big companies have really gotten into the space and made it much more competitive. Here's a couple of ways that uh, brands define themselves in the natural space. Uh, Burt's Bees focuses on their ingredients. Uh, they say that our ingredients right down to the packaging are simple, natural, and responsible. Aveda says that they define naturally derived ingredients to be those for which more than 50% of the molecule comes from a plant, uh, non-petroleum, mineral, water, or some other natural source. Um, these definitions, you know, particularly the Aveda one, they met with some criticism because, you know, they use things that other people don't consider natural, but their consumers believe their natural story. And so that's why they're looked at as a natural brand. But, you know, it's up to you to decide what definition of natural you want to follow. Um, coming up with this definition is crucial to deciding what formulation strategy you're able to follow. And now, it, it's going to set the ingredients that you can use. It'll set the performance targets that you can expect to achieve. This is one thing I want to point out is that um, it's, when you're formulating natural, it's more difficult than when you're formulating standard uh, formulas because the standard, the standard formulator can use every single ingredient that the natural formulator can use, but then they can also use all the other ingredients too. So it's just an easier way to formulate. So that brings us to the next part of the webinar, natural product formulation strategies. Now, I can't go into the details of every type of formulation, but what I can do is outline some formulation strategies that you might use, you know, based on whatever uh, definition of natural that you're going to follow. And so that's what we'll do here. So as a formulator, I really see this as there's four levels of formulating that can be used to make cosmetic formulas. Uh, the level of to which you achieve will depend on what you mean by the word natural. Now, these levels include a tier one, which is a true nature. This just means taking something that already exists out in nature, maybe purifying a bit and then putting it in a packaging and calling it a cosmetic. Uh, the tier two is an organic standard. And these are really the most difficult standards to follow. Uh, they're the most strict and you are really limited to almost no synthetic ingredients in your formulas. There's the tier three formulating where this is the level in which, you know, you follow some natural standard either by your own company or by a certifying body. Uh, you know, in these cases, some synthetic chemicals uh, are okay to use. And so that's why you find as, as far as formulating go, these tier three formulas are the most commonly found uh, in the natural space. Um, and then, of course, there's the tier four, which is greenwashing. And this is a level in which you just take a standard formula, add some natural ingredients, a natural story, and call it natural. Uh, and actually, you'll find a lot of products on the market are just this. So let's look at these strategies a bit more detail. The, the tier one formulating is the what many people who make natural cosmetics, they, they kind of dream of following this, right? Wouldn't it be great if you could go out find some plant, take some of the uh, pieces of that plant and whip it up in making it uh, cosmetics. Um, these types of products would be, you know, almost like food. Um, and you really strive for minimal processing, no synthetic chemical reactions. And if there actually were a cosmetic plant, this is the kind of level of uh, formulating that you'd follow. Now, there are some ingredients that when taken directly from nature can work as cosmetics, things like coconut oil, uh, lanolin, beeswax, honey, um, and these can all be packaged up and sold for their cosmetic benefits. The benefits that you can get from this type of formulating though are severely limited. So you don't really find a lot of companies following this formulation strategy. The next tier of formulating is uh, one in which you follow the USDA National Organic Program rules, the NOP. Uh, and these are the most strict rules that are, are out there and very few cosmetic products would actually qualify. The NOP program is the federal regulatory framework governing organic food. It, you know, it was made law in 2002 and administered by the USDA. Uh, the act uh, of 1990 required uh, that the USDA develop a national standard for organic products, uh, but this was all focused on foods. 
Then, then some cosmetic marketers got the idea that they might be able to qualify for the USDA organic standards. And so the USDA put together these organic standards for cosmetics. And so if a personal care product contains or is made up of agricultural ingredients and can meet the, the organic production, uh, handling, processing, and labeling standards, then it can be eligible for being certified under the NOP regulations. Now, since uh, you can't have any synthetic ingredients to qualify uh, for the USDA organic standards, very few cosmetics can actually be certified under this program. It's really hard to. You just can't make products that work very well. Having said that, these tier one and tier two, since it's so hard to do, this means that there's a lot less competition. So if you follow that strategy, uh, you can be successful. Tier three, this is the next level of formulating, which I call natural certification. Some companies that follow this strategy, they, they pick um, a formulating standard or they create their own, and then they make products in accordance with those standards. Now, the standards are a bit looser than the USDA standards because they allow some synthetic chemical processing. This allows manufacturers to make products that perform more closely to the cosmetic products that people are used to, right? Here's the list of some of the most important natural standards groups in the United States. Uh, now, these aren't all the groups, but they're really the ones that have gotten the most traction or that consumers know the most. They include the NSF International, which they have a made with organic personal care standards. Uh, there's the Natural Products Association, who uh, has their own specific standards for naturalness. And then the EWG Verify, this is a program started by the Environmental Working Group. Uh, who is best known in the personal care industry for their skin deep database. Now, I won't cover all these all in detail, but we delve more deeply into these standards in our natural course. As far as international standards go, um, you know, all the standards mentioned, they differ a bit from each other, but uh, in the little details, uh, but you know, they, these are just the U U.S. standards. There's some international standards. Uh, there's EcoCert in France, the Soil Association in the U.K., uh, Bioform in Belgium, Natru. Uh, you know, many of these groups got together and they got under a single one called Cosmos. Now, the Cosmos uh, standard, it's an attempt to harmonize the EU natural standards. Uh, the organizations, you know, they got together and agreed on something. So here are the things they did promoting the use of products from organic agriculture and respecting biodiversity, using natural resources responsibly and respecting the environment, using processing, processes and manufacturing that are clean and respectful of human health and the environment. Uh, then also following the precautionary principle in which any questionable ingredient uh, is avoided until it's been proven adequately safe. They also uh, uh, focus on integrating and developing the concept of green chemistry. Now, when I was at the In Cosmetics show a couple of years ago, it seemed like almost every raw material supplier was touting the fact that they were EcoCert approved. And that just demonstrates to you that, uh, at least as far as raw material suppliers go, people are really concerned with making sure that you have uh, natural certified ingredients. All right, uh, we talked about the different groups. Let's talk about the different standards a little bit. As I suggested, each standard is a bit different. Uh, there are some things in common, but you know, then the details are a little different. Let's look at the common things first. Um, it's generally understood that a natural ingredient is one that is not synthetically derived nor synthetically processed. Essentially, it means that a natural ingredient should be something that is found in nature and has minimal processing done to it. Uh, this is the standard by which the NOP program works. And if it doesn't come from a plant, except the mineral or water, uh, then it shouldn't be considered natural. And this is why it's so difficult to create cosmetics that are within the scope of the NOP program. Other standards allow for some chemistry. I mean, since there isn't uh, you know, a shampoo bush out there, yeah, you need, if you want shampoos, you're gonna need to loosen the restrictions a bit. In fact, there are very few surfactants in nature that would compared to the cleansing ability of, you know, synthetic surfactants. Some commonly prohibited ingredients, uh, if you're formulating naturally, you, of course you avoid uh, parabens, formaldehyde donors, petrolatum or petroleum derived ingredients, propylene glycol, any ethoxylated ingredients, ethanolamines like MEA, DEA or TEA, 
synthetic polymers that you know might have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like PVP or other acrylates, synthetic fragrances, synthetic silicones like dimethicone, uh, and EDTA is another one. So these are just some ingredients that most of the standards will uh, avoid. Some other things that you should consider beyond the ingredients, you know, most of these standards uh, are against technologies like nanoparticles. Uh, in the EU, you have to stay away from GMO. It's not as uh, uh, much of a problem in the United States. Um, and then uh, finally, these standards also encourage suppliers to look for free trade practices and uh, ingredients that uh, don't exploit the land of indigenous people and that avoid animal testing. So it's a lot to consider as a natural formulator. But I just want you to remember, anyone can come up with their own natural standards. If you're going to formulate to the tier three level, the key thing is to come up with some standard that you follow and that your natural consumers believe in. Uh, you don't have to follow one of these standards that are already set out there. Although I would say you follow one of the standards that are already out there, uh, that does make your formulating job easier. And it also makes defending yourself uh, from a lawsuit uh, easier too, because you can point to the fact that you follow this other established standard rather than just coming up with your own thing. Since the tier three uh, formulating uh, and in higher is really what most of you are going to be following, I wanted to mention what I see as some of the most difficult challenges facing natural formulators. The biggest challenges we'll uh, face are going to include preservation. It's going to include coloring your products, uh, finding effective cleansers, and of course, emulsification. Uh, really, the hardest thing probably is the fact that consumers already have an expectation of how products work because they've grown up on products uh, that are pretty much standard products this whole time. Uh, and then so when you produce products that don't meet those consumer expectations, they don't want to buy them anymore. So um, I, I did want to, uh, I'm gonna talk more about uh, preservatives and colors, but, um, and we, we cover uh, a lot more of this stuff in our practical cosmetic formulating course, uh, but I want to, comment on some of the most ingredients, most common ingredients that I get asked about for replacement. People are always asking, uh, could you have a replacement? What's a re natural replacement for petrolatum or mineral oil? What's a silicone replacement or a polymer replacement? Now, the reality is that there really aren't, for most of these things, there really aren't any great replacements. You know, as a natural formulator, the best that you can do is mimic these ingredients. Now, you're going to find cosmetic raw material suppliers say, oh, we've this is a, this is a natural replacement for petrolatum. And, you know, you, you could probably use it where you use petrolatum, but what you have to understand is it's not going to work the same. It may not work as well. Uh, it may have other things about it. Uh, the, the reason that these types of ingredients are used in cosmetics is because not, not because they cost less. Um, often, you know, some of these things cost more, but it's because these ingredients have been found to work the best for whatever specific use they've had, right? Uh, you know, nothing in nature is as slick as a silicone like dimethicone. Dimethicone is just ridiculously slippery. And synthetic thickeners, they were developed specifically to outperform the natural thickeners that we used to use, like natural gums. So what I want you to do is ex expect your performance to be less. However, there is a silver lining here, don't get me wrong. Um, the reality is that usually you can find something that works good enough. So don't expect it to work just as well, but it usually will work well enough. And remember, as a natural formulator, you're trying to create a product that works well enough while still fitting in with your definition of what is natural. All right, let's look at some of the preservatives. Here's a list of common preservatives. And you know these things have been proven to be effective and they're used in a lot of cosmetics. And unfortunately, nearly all of them have to be avoided by a uh, natural formulator. And so what can you use? Now the different standards have different approved cosmetic uh, preservatives, but here's a list of the more common ones uh, from the EcoCert or the Cosmo standards. So you have benzyl alcohol, sorbic acid and its salts, benzoic acid, salicylic acid, and dehydroacetic acid. Now there are others, but th these are really the main ones. So when you're putting together formulas, these are the kind of things that you have to use. Now some people think phenoxyethanol is okay, uh, other people don't. Uh, it's it's really uh, just a 
depends on how you define things. You know, it can be difficult to formulate with preservatives like these because uh, they tend to destabilize emulsions and they're only effective at pH levels of uh, below five. Now, maybe you can formulate it a little different to get uh, to work higher, but you know, you can only, you know, count on it at a pH level of five or lower. Now I should note that these, uh, none of these compounds are actually naturally produced, right? The ones that you can buy and that you use in your cosmetics, these are all synthetically produced. The rationale for allowing them is that they do exist in nature. So even though the actual ingredients aren't from nature, the compounds themselves exist there. So we'll call it natural. I also get asked uh, about uh, licorice ferment or grapefruit extract. You know, based on the evidence that I've seen, I'm not convinced that these are suitable preservatives for any cosmetic product that would be put out on the market. Uh, maybe if it's something you're using at home, you can try it. But uh, if you're going to sell products, I wouldn't use uh, uh, licorice ferment or grapefruit extract. They, they just don't work well enough. Now, I should mention about colorants. You might think that colorants would be relatively easy to find natural versions of. However, this really isn't the case. Colorants are the most highly regulated of all cosmetic ingredients in the US. And if you're adding an ingredient to your formula for the purpose of using a colorant, you can only use approved FDA colors. As far as natural goes, these are the only approved natural colorants for, from the FDA. Uh, beta carotene, annatto, caramel, beetroot, chlora, chlorophyllin, et cetera. Now, I, I wanna point out here, um, I've seen some advice where people say, oh, well, go find a natural extract and it has a natural color and you can add that natural color to your formulations to color your product. You can't do that. That is technically illegal. Now, if you're adding an ingredient, if you have the specific purpose of adding this ingredient to create a color, you, you just, you're just not allowed to do that as far as uh, it goes in the United States. Um, let's talk about the fourth tier. The, the final tier is uh, natural formulating. Now, greenwashing is a formulation strategy in which you take a product, a standard product, add some uh, organic extracts or other natural sounding ingredients, make it smell like a plant, change the color and change the packaging, put the term natural or herbal on it, and that really helps sell. Now, the thing is, greenwashing continues to work, and a lot of big natural brands continue to be successful using this green rising strategy. The main reason they do this is because it's affordable and you don't have to make compromises when it comes to your product's performance. In fact, most cosmetic brands are some form of greenwashing in nearly all products. So which is the best strategy for you to formulate? I, you know, that I can't really answer for you. That's up to you and your company. But ultimately, if you want to have a successful product line, you're going to have to find a group of consumers who want to buy your products. And if you can find enough of people who want to like your story and they like your products, then you can be successful with any of these formulation strategies. But I just want to remind you that if no one is buying your products uh, and they don't like the way that it works, it doesn't really matter how it was formulated or how natural it is. It's not worth making because people aren't going to want to continue to use it. So the bottom line is no matter what formulation strategy you use, you got to do one that works. Now, here's a, just a general look at the market. So this is what you're competing against as a natural formulator. Most of the formulas on the market are just greenwash stories and people are buying and people buy them because greenwash products work. Uh, it's very difficult. And as a natural formulator, you're going to have to know how to compete with that. Essentially, you'll have to say, look, we they use ingredients we wouldn't use. And so uh, that's that we're not competing with them. We're competing on our own. And here's our products. Um, you know, it's just a, a very difficult. It's it's any one of these is a viable way of uh, make certain cosmetic formulas. It's just that you're going to have a very difficult time uh, being successful using a product line that uses a level one strategy uh, when you're competing against, uh, you know, somebody who's greenwashing. All right, finally, let's look at some examples of the company. We're, we're going to be finishing up in like five minutes here. So we'll look at some examples of companies and how they formulate in. So in our natural formulation course, we get into more details about formulas. But this presentation, we're going to look just at conditioners, mostly because you can actually make a reasonably good hair conditioner from things that are right out of nature. So here is uh, just the range of hair conditioners made following the different tiers of natural formulating. Uh, we'll go all the way from greenwashing uh, all the way to just more natural. 
So here is an example of a greenwash strategy. Um, their conditioning ingredients are the same as standard. They use steramidal propyl dimethylamine and they use disteryl dimonium chloride. These things don't exist in nature, right? They, they do avoid traditional preservatives, so they opt for benzyl alcohol instead of parabens or formaldehyde donors. But otherwise, this is a pretty standard uh, conditioner formula. This formula, it's a tier three formula, this formula attempts to be more natural and they even have a certification of gluten-free standard. Uh, of course, you're not gonna put gluten products in a conditioner anyway, but that's beside the point. They do make the mistake in the ingredient by not listing it in the proper order or using INCI names. But if you look past that, the, the formula does stay away from standard cationic surfactant and instead relies on oils to provide the conditioning effect. But you still see synthetic ingredients like glycerol stearate and acetyl alcohol. These things don't exist in nature. Uh, but according to the certification, these things are allowed. Now, here's the more complicated, the tier two uh, formulation. This is USDA certified organic. And they don't use any synthetic ingredients. But they seem to rely on an in-situ saponification reaction with coconut oil and olive oil. Uh, to provide some of that emulsification and also to make the product a little easier to rinse out. Now, this doesn't look like it would be a particularly effective conditioner, but uh, it would be an organic certified conditioner. And then finally, we have an all natural conditioner. This would be the tier one. And this is a, just a big tub of coconut oil. Coconut oil can actually be beneficial to hair for some things, but the, the formula isn't going to go do too well for like detangling, you know, at least compared to things like silicones or what people are used to. But again, if your consumer wants natural, you don't get much more nat than natural than something like this. All right, just to summarize what we've covered in this talk, we learned about the cosmetic natural cosmetic industry and uh, the opportunity that it provides for cosmetic brands. We also learned about the different groups who have different natural standards and how those standards are set. We talked about the formulation strategies to create products to the level of naturalness that you want. And we also covered the different motivations of natural formulators. Now, shortly, uh, we're gonna go over the questions that might've been sent in. Hopefully you guys are putting in some questions there. Uh, before do, we do that, I just want to re-mention our natural uh, cosmetic formulation course. Uh, we're still taking students there, right here. We're still taking students. Um, and in this course, it's, an, it's all online, the course. Uh, it, we define natural. Uh, we explore the functional natural ingredients. We talk specifically about natural skincare and hair care formulations and how to, nat how to market natural products. You can go right there at that link there. Uh, for just people on this webinar, we'll have also a free 15 minute one on one call. So you start the course. If you have questions for me uh, about the material or about anything formulated, I'd be happy to talk to you. You also have lifetime access to the material. So you sign up, you never lose access. There's a money back guarantee. I, I have a money back guarantee for all of my stuff. Uh, so I, I, I just want you guys to, to learn stuff and uh, be happy with what you, you've learned. So we also have a, a, a webinar discount. 10%. Uh, so if you use a coupon code NATWEB, uh, you'll get that discount. So go there and check that out. All right. That brings us on to the question uh, portion here. So let me uh, switch back uh, to the... Ah, there we are. All right. Hopefully you were putting on some uh, questions there. Hopefully you found that helpful. Thank you so much to everybody who joined. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the questions that were sent in. Uh, and just to give you an idea here, uh, I'm looking at, uh, we have uh, uh, 58 questions were sent in. So that's what we've, we've got going through here, um, uh, which I will answer as soon as it comes up here. Okay. Uh, here's a question uh, from... Amita, how do you get safety testing for your natural products? Uh, typically for safety testing, um, you there, there's a number of things you can do. So you can get uh, safety information from your raw material suppliers. You should be doing that. But if you have to do patch testing or things, there are just there are testing houses that will do this. Uh, go to the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. Uh, they have a consultant area where it has a list of testing houses specifically for that or uh, the Happy's Buyer Guide that can tell you uh, of testing houses. So 
essentially when you're doing safety testing, the best thing to do is to uh, find a, an independent testing house that will do the testing for you. That way, uh, when you're challenged on the safety of your products, you have this independent audit of your own products. Uh, next question here, uh, what are examples of surfactants and preservatives accepted with naturally certified products? Uh, I talked about uh, some of the preservatives in the webinar. As far as surfactants go, um, there, there are a ton of surfactants and it really depends on your uh, application for cleansing surfactants. You can use uh, the, the alpha polyglucosides, uh, glycerol uh, glucoside or desoglucoside. Uh, but it really depends on what natural standards you're going to follow. Uh, you could use glycerol stearate as, as far as non-ionics go. So there's a, there's a lot you can do. Um, the, we, we cover a ton of those in our, uh, in our course. Um, all right, next question. Um, so a question from Kathleen. I'm still working with silver citrate, citric acid, and potassium sorbate as my natural preservative. I'm wondering why not many other people are not using this wonderful combination. The FDA just approved the use of silver citrate and citric acid combo for disinfecting food services. I think the, the primary reason for not using that combination is that it destabilizes emulsions. And so it's just more difficult to work with. It's also hasn't been used in cosmetics uh, very much. Uh, so there isn't a history of safe use. Uh, so th that's really, I mean, it, if it, if it uh, demonstrates uh, uh, effectiveness and safety, uh, maybe people will switch to that. But like I said, when it's destabilizing emulsions, um, it makes uh, creating gels harder too. Uh, that just makes it a harder to, a, a thing to, to use. Okay, uh, next question here. Uh, here's a question from uh, Severine. Uh, don't you think that organic cosmetics is just about greenwashing? <laughs> um, well, as you saw uh, at, at the when I was talking about the formulation strategies, yes, there, there's a ton of greenwashing in the natural space. There will continue to be a ton of greenwashing because the reality is those standard products, they can be made easier and they can be made to work better than most natural products. Making natural co cosmetic products is difficult. Uh, but as far as uh, it's just about greenwashing, I don't think it's just about greenwashing. There can be th there there can be good reasons to go to natural formulating. Uh, the sustainability of ingredients. You know, we're going to run out of uh, pet petroleum at some point, uh, and um, you know, it could be within a hundred years or so. I mean, th that might be a while for any of us. Uh, but it is a that it is a, a limited ingredient. It's not sustainable. It's not good for the environment. And I could certainly see a good reason to switch to uh, uh, ingredients that are more sustainable. So it's not just about greenwashing, but a lot of the products that are successful on the market, I would agree, are just greenwashing. Okay, next question. Um, uh, hi, Perry. What this is from uh, Jeanette. Uh, what kind of natural homemade cosmetics can be made on a budget for personal use? Uh, what packaging would work? Um, things like hair conditioners, you, you know, using coconut oil for hair conditioning, they can. Um, using, I mean, it depends on what you're going to consider natural, of course. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the reality is that I focus mostly on stuff that you're going to uh, make and sell. Um, and so I, I don't have a lot. I mean, the, the reality is if you're on a, if I think if you're on a budget, it's going to be less expensive to go buy standard products than to make uh, homemade natural ones at, at home. It's, it's just, it's just uh, more affordable. Um, and uh, that's just my opinion. Okay. Uh, next question here. Yasmin asks, how can you make oil serums uh, have a nice silky glide and absorb very well without an oily after effect? Um, well, the standard way to do that is that you use silicones. Uh, it's more difficult when you're using um, uh, just natural ingredients. And so I'm assuming you have uh, natural ingredients. Um, it's just the specific blend of uh, 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 
the sp specific blend of fatty fatty acids and oils that you use. Some oils will glide better than others. Uh, the, the oils that glide better typically are ones that have a, uh, a, a longer hydrocarbon chain. Um, and so, you know, like an olive oil will glide better because that has a C18 than say coconut oil, which is more of a, a C, C12 and C14s. Uh, and so, you know, you use, use oils that have a, uh, a higher, a longer chain link distribution of the fatty acids uh, that could help, um, but it's it's a it's another one of those things that's uh, when you're formulating natural, you have to sort of give up your expectations of uh, you know of performance and then decide within the natural space what are the ingredients that are going to work the best. All right, uh, we're coming at the end here. Um, uh, what are questions here? Let's see. Here's a question from Angelique. Uh, is it possible to make an anti-aging cream with fulvic acid? And more importantly, is fulvic acid effective? Uh, effective to do what? Uh, I, I haven't seen any evidence that fulvic acid is a particularly effective anti-aging ingredient. Um, anti-aging ingredients, uh, probably the best is niacinamide or um, uh, retinol. Those are two that really have the most proof. Other things uh, have some interesting lab data, but as far as what's effective, uh, you know, those are the most effective choices. I, I don't think uh, fulvic acid has been proven to be effective as compared to those. Um, Melissa asked the, uh, me to repeat the name of the book that I referenced. Um, it's called Formulating uh, Natural Cosmetics by Anthony Dweck. It's a pretty good book put out by All Your Red Books. Uh, okay, uh, I am Perry Romanowski, and this is our uh, Chemist Corner webinar for the Practical Cosmetic Formulating uh, students at Potential Students. Um, so let's see, we have a question from Mia. I made an all-natural blend that cleared up my nine-year-old, my nine-year seborrheic dermatitis. How can I word my product to say it's good for scalp conditions without making a direct claim that will cause it to cross over into the drug category? Uh, this is uh, this is a great question. Uh, my my first suggestion, and you know, some point I'm going to do a uh, a webinar on just claims, but uh, right, you you can't. You can't say that your all natural oil will clear up somebody's seborrheic dermatitis. That would make it a drug and it's just not legal, at least in the United States. Uh, what I would do is that go look at what other uh, companies are saying about their products uh, that are sort of in the same realm. And you can kind of copy that kind of thing um, as, you know, as far as uh, dermatitis goes, you, you can use the, uh, specific terms uh like uh soothes soothes your skin um refreshes your skin your scalp that that kind of thing use use terms that are not specific enough that they would make drug claims um uh, and and that's kind of what happens uh yermo yes i need to know the what it means the natural cosmetics we went through that during the webinar so hopefully you got that answered um here's a question from tanisha i have a bachelor's of science in forensic chemistry but always wanted to have my own cosmetic company could i use that degree to become a cosmetic chemist uh yes i think you could probably get a cosmetic chemist job or at least a technician job with a, a bachelor's of science in uh, forensic chemistry um, it would help to take a course, you know, like our online course to give you a sense of the kind of chemistry you have to know uh, in uh, the cosmetic industry. That'll make you much better prepared to interview for jobs and things. Uh, but as far as your background goes, uh, I think you, you, you have a better shot than, say, somebody who has a degree in accounting who wants to become a cosmetic chemist, uh, because at least you have a science background. Okay, here's a, uh, uh, let's see, it's a question from Mary Nicole. How can I cost my raw materials to arrive at a cost per product? Uh, we actually have a, uh, a, a 
a video on on the blog about how to do exactly that. Uh, I can't get into it right here, but I'll send you a link uh, to that video. Um, Mary Nicole says, can I get a link to the recorded video at webinars? Uh, yes, I'm going to send out a, a replay link too. Okay, here's a formula from, here's a question from Ross. Now I'm trying to formulate a natural clean beauty style toothpaste and have been trying to use a self-preserving cosmetic approach. I've been experimenting with keeping water activity below 0.75 and or keeping the pH above 10, approximately 10.1. Both of these uh, satiate the ISO 29261, which would mean that USP 51 isn't required. Uh, is it still worth performing the USP 51 test on said products? And also, would such products be likely to pass a USP 51 test? I fear that they may not due to the conditions having a bacteriostatic effect as opposed to killing bacteria. So it's a it's an interesting question. Um, uh, my philosophy is that when in doubt, uh, you should always test. Um, you should, I, I even recommend that people test um, even their anhydrous products, which really probably aren't going to grow bacteria. But the reason for testing is that you want to defend, be able to defend yourself if somebody sues you in court and says, uh, you know, I got contamination from, from your product. You should have data available that says, uh, no, you didn't look at my, I, my test. I did my due diligence. I passed these tests. Uh, I followed this. Uh, just being able to say that, uh, you know, uh, my water activity was below 0.75 and I had a pH of 10, if someone could just say, well, did you test it? And you would have to say no and admitting a, a flaw there. So my recommendation is even though you uh, have those uh, qualifications, yes, do the test just to do it to make sure, especially something that is going to go into people's mouths and has a high potential of causing problems. Okay, we've uh, hit the top of the hour. Now, I just want to thank everybody who came out to the webinar. I'll, I'll keep answering some questions. So if you want to keep posting questions, feel free to. Uh, but thank you, everyone else who, who is going to go. Uh, I should mention that I'm going to be in New York City for the annual Society of Cosmetic Chemist uh, Scientific Symposium. I'm going to be there from December uh, 9th through the, the December 12th. And so maybe if, you, if you're in New York City and you want to uh, meet up there, we can uh, we can do that. So I'll I'll send out some more information about that. But uh, thank you, everyone who came to the webinar and I'll see you at next month's webinar. All right. Let me get back to some questions after I get a quick sip of tea here. Uh, Matt had asked about preservatives. We mentioned that in the in the webinar there. Um, uh, Adaze asks, what are the correct percentage range for different organic ingredients? Uh, I'm afraid a question like that is just way too broad. Uh, I would need more specifics, but because, uh, you know, how much you use of an ingredient really depends on what that ingredient is. Um, here's a question from Ivana. I would appreciate your comment on usage of essential oils and natural products, you know, regarding dosage and restrictions. Uh, the problem with essential oils is that uh, there are many people in the world who have sensitivities and allergic reactions to essential oils. So you can't use them at levels uh, that are very high. So, you know, the highest level is typically for a cosmetic is going to be a 1% level. And that's uh, if you're using the essential oil for um, a natural scent. If you start getting higher than 1%, uh, you start increasing the chances that more and more people are going to uh, have a bad reaction. So, uh, it's, of course, it depends on the specific essential oil, but I would max out at 1%. Some essential oils actually have uh, uh, maximum dosage. If you look at IFRA, I -F -R -A, uh, they, they have a listing of the safety levels of ingredients, and that, that can give you a sense of how much you're allowed to use. Uh, here's a question from uh, Tina. I have a shampoo and conditioner for over two years that has not been used or sold. Can it be restored? Um, well, I mean, you can use it still. Uh, I actually had a formula that I kept for like seven years. Uh, the, the product will, I mean, here it is. It will still probably clean hair, so it'll still probably work. 
Uh, the preservative system may have broken down in two years, depends on the, the product. So that could certainly be a problem. It might not smell as good. I mean, when we formulate in cosmetics, we go for a one year shelf life. Uh, two years is a long time. Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable selling that. I wouldn't feel good about selling that, but uh, I would probably still use it myself. Uh, but I, you know, I wouldn't recommend other people use it. So it's, it's really just a, a personal opinion um, and what you feel comfortable, what kind of risk you were, you're, you're willing to take. Um, Christina says, uh, hello, I was under the impression that there are two parabens that are safe and that due to fear mongering, all restricted. Is that the case? Uh, actually, uh, pretty much all of the parabens are safe for use in cosmetics. Uh, uh, the only ones that are restricted are, uh, I believe, butyl paraben and uh, 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 another longer chain one, uh, propyl paraben, something like that. Uh, anyway, the SCCS had reviewed all the safety data, but things like methyl paraben, ethyl paraben, you know, those are safe as as used. Um, there's the, the bottom line is parabens are highly tested, highly safe ingredients. And it is just fear mongering that uh, has has gave them a bad name. It's not really based on safety data. So they, they are safe. Um, there's more than two are safe. Um, there are some restrictions for leave on products for some of them, but most of the ones that you use in cosmetics uh, are not restricted about that. Uh, there are use level restrictions, of course, uh, in in the EU, in Japan, but they're safe to use, bottom line. Here's a question from uh, Carol. Uh, is it possible to offer gamma irradiated natural products? Um, see the silt mask, for example, which does not need any extra ingredients to be effective. So gamma radiation replaces preservatives for the US and EU market. Um, well, uh, I, for the EU market, I, I don't think that would be uh, allowed. Uh, the EU is much more strict than the US when it comes to uh, product evaluation and product safety requirements before getting out on the market. As far as in the United States goes, um, you you certainly could put a product like that uh, out on the market. You're going to have to prove that it is um, safe. I don't know how you're going to prove that, but if you can come up with some way to prove that it's safe, you could do that. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, whenever you do something that's uh, outside the norm, you're opening yourself up to some legal risks. And I, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, um, even though, you know, technically, you know, maybe gamma radiation uh, could replace preservatives immediately. But, you know, once if it's a one time use product, it's probably less of a risk. Uh, if it's a multi use product, it's, it's a bit scarier. Um... I have a question about parabens answered. Uh, here's a question from Annie. Are parabens not found in nature? Uh, yeah, parabens are found in nature, but when you're coming up with natural standards here, remember it's just somebody coming up with the standards. And generally the word paraben is for the consumer that you're going for, whether parabens are natural or not found in nature or not, um, that consumer d doesn't really care about that. They don't trust parabens. Uh, so as a natural formulator, it's really hard to uh, sell the story that I'm a natural formulator and I'm using parabens, even if that uh, parabens exist in nature. Uh, you know, there, uh, this area of formulating isn't, this isn't set in stone. A lot of it is people's opinions and it's not based on science. Um, here is a question from Tania. Can I state that greenwashing falls into clean beauty definition or tier three? Uh, I would say uh, greenwashing. Uh, like greenwashing is tier four. It's not. It's not tier three. Clean beauty, uh, on some level, uh, you know, on some level, clean beauty, I think, is greenwashing because they use. They're okay with synthetic ingredients uh, be, because here's the problem with clean beauty. Okay. It's already illegal to sell cosmetics on the United States market that are not proven safe, right? You, you, it's, it's illegal to sell unsafe cosmetics. So when someone says they're clean beauty and the focus on safety, I don't know what they're focusing on because products are already safe. 
So where does that fall? Yes, it would fall. Clean beauty could fall in greenwashing because they're using synthetic ingredients that everyone else is using and they're saying they're safe, but you know, they're all safe. So on some level, you're right. It, it, clean beauty is kind of greenwashing for some things. Um, here's a question from Severine. Uh, Pet Petrolatum is from fossil oil from the earth. So why is it so demonized? Uh, I don't know. People are afraid of petroleum. You're right. You're absolutely right. Petrolatum is a natural ingredient. It's not synthetic. Mineral oil is a natural ingredient. Again, these things are not synthetic. It's just that uh, the consumers and the marketers in this space don't see that as natural. Now, to their credit, um, the real problems with petrolatum and mineral oil as being natural ingredients, they are natural but they're a limited supply. We're going to run out. We're not making we're not making new uh, petrolatum and new mineral oil in any kind of speedy way. Uh, whereas plant ingredients, uh, you can grow a plant, get coconut oil, and the next year you can get more coconut oil. So it's a sustainable, repeatable ingredient, and that's the problem with uh, petrolatum um, and mineral oil. They just aren't uh, they just aren't sustainable. Uh, Daniel asks, is there any indication that the FDA is enforcing its rules around colorants? Has anyone been cited by the FDA for using a plant extract that have an inherent color? Um, well, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, generally, I'm, I'm not aware of any recent uh, actions, but you know, the FDA sends letters to companies that are making claims, and they do police that. So uh, whether it's been i haven't seen anything public about that uh but your the, the bottom line is you are taking a risk uh you are uh breaking the rules and the, and the law according to the fda when you do that uh but you know it's uh it's some some people are willing to take that risk in fact i've seen a number of natural brands call themselves uh, all natural colorants um, and specifically you know talk about using plant extracts and things uh, at the moment they're still doing it uh, the FDA might get around to to getting them, and uh, you know that that could lead to fines. That could lead to that's going to lead to you having to change your formulations completely, and you might you know destroy your entire brand by doing that. But like I said, that's a risk some people are willing to take. Uh, here's uh, one from Juan. Do you know uh, uh, quinoa sapine concentrate? It works like a natural surfactant. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is one of the one of the few natural uh, cleansing surfactants out there. Do you think that it can be used to formulate natural cosmetics? Uh, just changing the synthetic surfactant, uh, and the answer is no. You can't. Uh, the saponins, as what you're talking about, it, 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 they come from like the soapwort plant. They do indeed. Uh, they are uh, cleansing surfactants. Uh, they just don't work well enough. They don't work as well as soap. Uh, it. It takes a lot of them, and they are quite irritating to skin. So you can't just simply take uh, synthetic out and put this uh, 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 saponin in and expect to have a, a reasonable formula. It Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. All right, this is uh, just answering questions here at the end of the webinar here. I am Perry Romanowski from Chemist Corner. I thank you all for coming, and I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I've got, uh, wow, a, a bunch more questions. We'll, we'll go through, uh, I'll, I'll go through about uh, 15 more minutes of questions uh, or whatever we have here, and uh, uh, we'll just get to, get to answering. Thank you so much, everybody who's, uh, who's come to the webinar, paid attention, and supports my things. Uh, becomes part of the SCC, follows me on Twitter. Uh, and Twitter, we're Chemist Corner. Uh, on Instagram, I've, I've got the Beauty Brains uh, 2018 on Instagram, and we have Facebook. So feel free to follow all of that. Um, here we go. Um, just going through. Uh, Here's a question from Adele. I have a bachelor's degree in biology. How would you advise me to start learning cosmetic formulation? Uh, a great way, since you have a science background, a great way would be to take our practical cosmetic formulating course. Uh, that's an online course. You can find more information at chemistcorner.com. Now, uh, if you don't want to take an online course uh, through the Society of Cosmetic Chemists, there are live courses. Um, so go to seconline.org. You can find that. Um, that's that's how I get started, uh, especially if you have a science background. 
um, that's a great way to get started uh, learning cosmetic formulating. Here's a question from uh, Adentuji. Uh, how do I get natural fragrances? Uh, uh, that's uh, natural fragrances uh, come from, you can, some essential oils could be used for natural fragrances, although there are some concerns about uh, allergic reactions there. Also, uh, typically you go to a fragrance house and you ask them for a natural fragrance. That's how, that's, that's how people do it. Uh, fragrance is really just a raw material and there are specific companies that make those. And so if you're looking for a natural fragrance, that's what you would ask for. And these, these companies uh, already make those things. Um, here's a question from Yulia. Uh, I've noticed titanium oxide is an approved colorant. Uh, it has been directly linked to diabetes. Uh, well, um, I, I haven't seen that it was linked to diabetes. It's uh, generally recognized as a safe ingredient, but uh, if, if more data comes out about that being a concern, uh, then I'm sure uh, uh, regulators will, will move to, uh, to look at that. But um, it's, it's hard to say that the, uh, the amount of titanium dioxide that you're exposed to in cosmetics would be uh, a cause of diabetes, uh, but you know, it could be and that regulations could be changing. Here's a question from Gal. How about vitamins? Vitamin C has the capability uh, of preserv uh, preservatives. Any comments on the other vitamins? Uh, I wouldn't use vitamins as preservatives. Uh, they are not effective enough. You can imagine bacteria has grown uh, low these hundreds of thousands and millions of years and adapted to anything like a vitamin C. So uh, th that would not be a s vitamin C or any other vitamin would not be a suitable preservative in cosmetics, uh, at least not, not uh, from my opinion and, and from doing testing, it, it's just not going to work. Uh, Emma asks, why are silicones considered bad? Uh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> they're great products, uh, but silicones are uh, synthetically produced materials. They're man-made. Uh, even though they do start from silicon dioxide, which you can get from sand. So technically, silicones are from nature, but people just don't look at them that way. They just aren't looked at that way. And so that's why they're considered bad. There's a lot of times these ingredients, uh, they get a bad reputation. It's not because of uh, their source or how they do or even their safety. It's just they get a, a bad reputation. And uh, that's that's hard to hard to combat. There's a question, uh, uh, Alessia says, does the program of the online course stipulate for some information on working with plant ethanol extracts? Um, uh, we do talk about extracts in, in the course. Uh, if you had some specific question on that, uh, I'd be uh, happy to talk about it uh, with you. Uh, here's David asks an interesting question. Do you think there will be ever, you know, in say five to 10 years, be a legal definition of natural cosmetics. Uh, me personally, I, I don't think so. No, I do not believe there will be. Um, and the reason I say that is because there are a lot of uh, market forces that are kind of against that. Uh, if you define natural specifically, um, that just... In, at least in the United States, I look at I look at it this way. In the United States, they weren't even able to get the term hypoallergenic uh, approved through the FDA. Defined uh, the FDA tried to do that in the 1970s, and then in in court, it was ruled that uh, no, the FDA cannot define uh, hypoallergenic. So if you can't define something as like specific as hypoallergenic means non-allergen, and you could put a test to that and say, here's a test that says that's uh, hypoallergenic and that one's not, uh, if you can't do something that specific, I just don't see how something like natural cosmetics could ever be specifically defined. I, I just don't see it. I could be wrong. You know, I often am, and this is just a prediction, but, uh, you know, the hard, the, the hard thing about making predictions is the future is oh, just so unknown. Uh, but, uh, it would be great if there was a definition for natural cosmetics. I just don't see it with this FDA, with the resources that they have. I just don't see it. It might happen in the EU. I, I think it would happen in the EU uh, much sooner than it will in the United States. But if it does happen in the EU, 
uh, then you'll see pretty much the people in the United States, the, the companies in the United States will kind of adopt that uh, kind of definition. That's just kind of how these things work. It's a good question, though. Um, here's, here's one. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, fulvic acid. We talked about that earlier. Um, yeah. Here's a question from Ronnie. What's your advice for someone who wants to pursue a career as a cosmetic chemist? Where do you start? Uh, oh, great place to start first. Uh, first place to start as a cosmetic chemist. Get a degree in uh, in science. Ideally, you'd get a, a college degree in chemistry or uh, chemical engineering. Those are the top two that are become cosmetic chemists. Um, or you can get a degree in biology or some related science. Uh, those those can work too. Pharmacy. Uh, once you get a degree, then you can go out um, searching for jobs. You you'd be qualified for uh, technician jobs, for chemist jobs in the cosmetic industry. Look for jobs. Um, uh, get involved with the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. That's a great place to uh, meet people who already have jobs. Uh, so the best place, the best way to get a job in the cosmetic industry is to uh, know somebody. So that helps. Uh, there are some internships available. A lot of those are on the East Coast in the New Jersey, New York, tri-state area. Um, but, you know, first get that. Now, the other thing you can do is uh, learn about formulating cosmetics. Uh, a course like our Practical Cosmetic Formulating course it gives you a great introduction to everything you need to know about formulating. This doesn't make you a formulator, but it teaches you everything you need to know. And then w when you get on the job, you're going to refer back to these things and you're going to take these lessons. But really becoming a cosmetic chemist, uh, the way to do that is to formulate, to, to make formulas, to test things out. Um, you can learn a lot through courses, through webinars, through books, but really you learn the most by doing. And uh, that's uh, that's how you become a cosmetic chemist. If you want a job at it, like I said, uh, Go to something like Suppliers Day in New York, where all the raw material suppliers from the entire industry come there. That'll give you an idea what companies uh, you should be seeking out to, to, to partner with. All right, hopefully that was helpful. We've got about uh, seven more questions I'll do here. Let's see. It's a question. Angelique says, can silk peptides be used as a substitute for silicone, say, to provide slip? Uh, you can substitute them. They aren't going to work as good as silicones, uh, but you can do that. Yes. Uh, now, generally, silk uh, peptides are going to be humectants, so moisturizing. So they're not really great for slip. Uh, you can, you would expect it to work something like uh, propylene glycol. It might have that kind of slip. It's not going to be a good substitute for silicones, but you can try it. Uh, Paya says, how can we test the purity of essential oils? Uh, well, essential oils are made up of fatty acids, so you can run it through a gas, gas chromatograph or an IR spectrum, and you can, you can look at the purity that way. There's also a spec, a spec sheet looking at uh, acid value, iodine value, um, these kind of quality control. You'd look at the, uh, uh, the color of it, that can affect it, the clarity of it, that can affect it. All of these things are put in the... Uh, the specifications, and that's how you can test for the purity of essential oils. Um, it's 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 kind of a complicated thing, though. Actually, one of the biggest challenges when working with natural materials is that they're not a specific ingredient, and they can change over time. Like depending on the crop conditions and the growing conditions, you'll get uh, a, a lighter color or a darker color. When you're using a synthetic uh, dimethicone, for example. You get the same thing every single time and that's one of the advantages is you have a consistent product using natural ingredients you don't always get consistent products it's a challenge um okay uh let's see just a few more questions here um uh, alessa says are we going to learn how to control the ph level of do-it-yourself cosmetics in the course uh we uh we do cover ph in the course yes um as far as controlling it, you know, that's a matter of it's not there's not much to, to learn there. You know, it's if you if you you test. So you make your product when the product comes out, you test the pH. If the, the pH is too low, you increase the pH by adding a base. If the pH is too high, you decrease the pH by adding an acid. Uh, and that's kind of how you control. Um, 
I have I apologize that the, you know sometimes I suffer from what's like the curse of knowledge and so when you when you have this bit of knowledge you just it's it's hard sometimes to to know what to assume that everyone else knows but uh, hopefully you found that that helpful yeah incidentally in the course I will answer any question I, I answer pretty much any question anytime but uh, but for people in the course I, I do prioritize your questions and I answer your questions and it can be really about anything formulating even if it's not covered in the course I'm happy to answer anything uh, what do you think of lucidal as a preservative uh, that's uh, asked by Nadia uh, it can work for some people I don't think it's a particularly effective preservative and I wouldn't rely on it myself some people do rely on it and they find uh, success with it uh, I I personally don't find it uh, suitable. Um, uh, Promila says, do you do natural skincare formulations in the course? Yes, we do cover skincare formulas, natural formulas, skincare in the course. Thanks for that question. All right, just a few more questions. Uh, Vanessa says, is Zemenia oil an emulsifying oil that can be used in natural product formulations? Um, I haven't, uh, honestly, I haven't used a Zemenia oil. Um, I don't, if it's, if it's an oil, it's probably not emulsifying. Um, but I, I'll have to look at that. That's a, that's an ingredient, uh, that is, uh, new information to me. So, uh, but if, like I said, if it's an oil, it's, it's not emulsifying. So it probably is not going to work as an emulsifier at, for most systems. Uh, here's a question from Verpal uh, regarding challenging testing on water-based products. Do you suggest challenge testing on a fresh sample or a sample that has been sitting on your shelf for about six months? And my recommendation is that you do both. So you want to immediately test a product so you'll know what it's like when it's made. And you also want to challenge test your preservative system after it's been sitting for some amount of time. Now, uh, in stability testing, I, I did a stability testing webinar a couple months ago, but in stability testing, what you would do is uh, you put a sample at 45 degrees Celsius for eight weeks, and then you challenge test uh, both uh, that sample and uh, a room temperature sample after eight weeks of sitting. And that should predict uh, how well your uh, preservative system will uh, work after say one year. So yes, I do recommend both uh, initially and after some time testing your preservative system. Uh, here's another one from Nadia. What what natural ingredients can I use for binding properties in place of polymers? Uh, that's going to depend on the uh, uh, that's going to depend on the formula. Like if, if you're talking about thickening, you can use xanthan gum. Uh, but for for binding, I I'd have to know what uh, what specifically you're you're trying to formulate. So. Uh, here's the question uh, from uh, Peya. Uh, for many years, my formula is protected. If I hire a third party to develop the product, oh, for how many years is my formula protected if I hire a third party to develop the product for me? Well, that depends on the deal you set with them. You could actually hire a cosmetic chemist to make the product for you, and then that formula is yours. Uh, that's going to be more expensive. You can uh, work with a contract manufacturer and have them make a custom product for you. And as long as you work with them and continue to work with them, then you can have an exclusive to your formula. So it really depends on uh, on the deal that you work out. But it can be anywhere from for a short amount of time, you know, one production run to forever. Um, all right, we just got uh, three more questions here. Uh, Annie said, I need to help you with your Instagram. <laughs> ah, you see, Annie, send me an email. I'd love to, uh, yeah, uh, I'd love to have you help with uh, with my Instagram. Maybe, maybe I've missed you. Oh, you know what? Maybe, uh, Annie, I will check to see if I got an email from you and respond to you. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, I just... Uh, I, I apologize. I don't always get to my emails as fast as I'd like. All right. Uh, two more questions. Uh, Melissa says, you mentioned notable exceptions to the guidelines that natural requires avoidance of synthetic and synthetically derived ingredients. What are the most notable exceptions? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I, the, now, what... 
what is uh, allowed as, as being natural depends on the, uh, the natural standard that you're following. So if you look at the cosmos standards, for example, they have a whole list of uh, synthetic chemical reactions that they allow. Saponification. Some people don't think saponification is synthetic. It is synthetic. It doesn't, you know, be, uh, it's a chemical reaction. It doesn't naturally occur. Uh, sometimes it'll happen when accidentally out in nature. But anyway, uh, that's a, a reaction, saponification. But sulfation is allowed. Um, there are a number of different types of things like that that are allowed. And so I, I'd, I'd need a more specific of that question, but that's the kind of thing. It's the kind of exceptions that I'm talking about. And finally, last question here from Maggie. Uh, do you have any guidance for the person formulating at home to get started producing a product for sale? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, my recommendation is this. If you, if you want to create a product for sale, um, it, it costs a lot of money to set up the proper manufacturing site, to have all the equipment, to get uh, inspected by the FDA. You know, you get inspected by the FDA. If you're just starting out, the hardest part about starting a cosmetic line is building your brand, marketing, and sales. And that's really what you should be focusing on. I wouldn't focus on creating the products yourself. The best That's the best thing that you should be outsourcing for sure. So if you have a formulation that you created at home, my recommendation is find a cosmetic chemist or a contract manufacturer that can help you uh, move that to a contract manufacturer that will produce the products for you. Uh, I'm not recommending that you produce products uh, yourself uh, in your own uh, uh, in your your own place because it's just the upfront cost of doing that and not knowing that you're going to be successful is is very difficult. You could end up making a, a huge batch that just you know sits in your basement or your garage and nobody buys. Now the same thing could happen um, with uh, a contract manufacturer. That's that's why that's why I believe that you should really focus on your marketing and sales efforts before uh, before you get started. And we we did a whole webinar on starting your own line, and uh, you can see that advice in that previous webinar. Uh, but um, that's the hard thing. You got to get good at marketing and get good at sales. And then once you get your formula, go to a contract manufacturer, have them make the first batch that you can, you can do small runs. You can do, you know, a hundred units or a thousand units, uh, but have someone else do it. Don't set up your own. If, if you don't have to, uh, now, of course, if you want to, if you, if you want to be in the business of making the formulas yourself and doing everything yourself, it's just cost more. You have to buy the right equipment, buy mixers, uh, heaters, uh, do the right, get the right paperwork. We, I have a whole uh, entry on the blog about setting up a, a lab and you would do all that. So that would be my guidance. My guidance, uh, my first, first thing is find a contract manufacturer, bring them to your formula and they'll copy it and create the product for you. All right, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, 90 minutes long. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. And I look forward to you uh, to talking to you at the next webinar. <coughs> Sorry. I am Perry Romanowski, and thanks for watching.